Hi, and welcome to Willow Roundtable Discussions. Willow is an events-driven community where industry experts and entrepreneurs can come together in social settings and share the latest intelligence in cutting-edge technology and investment opportunities. Our group discussion starts now. So hi everyone and thanks to The Amber Show and today is the topic we've all been looking for which is longevity and I'm going to hand over the reins to Toby who's going to do an intro and get everyone started. I'm Toby and I'm a co-founder of uh, Coherence Biotech and we focused on um, point of care lab automation. So today we're going to ask some sort of challenging technical questions to these four. Uh, let me introduce them. First is Chris. He's a managing partner at Pacific 8 Ventures, a VC firm focused on healthcare tech. So diagnostics, AI, robotics, and remote disease management. Uh, next, we have Dr. Fu. He's also a partner at Pacific 8. Uh, he's a doctor of medicine and previously practiced at Tangun Hospital and Tsuji Hospital. Uh, we have Sam Martin. He's a, he's a genetic specialist at Invite, which is a clinical grade genetic testing company. And uh, he was previously a counselor at Ambry Genetics and Beth Israel Medical Center and has a Master of Science in Human Genetics. Also, lastly, we have Richard. He has a PhD in Applied Biophysics and has a focus on studying uh, computational biology. So thank you. Thanks, everyone. So uh, let me start with some basic background questions. Uh, S Sam? <laughs> yes. C can you tell us a little bit about uh, what Invite does, what you do there. What's the difference between clinical grade genetic testing and something like 23andMe? Oh boy, <laughs> I just was explaining this here. Uh, so Invite is a, like I said, a clinical grade genetic testing company in San Francisco. And we test basically for all kind of clinical disorders, neurolo neurological, uh, cardiovascular, any oncology disorders, pediatric rare diseases. And the reason why we call ourselves clinical grade is because we have to separate ourselves from companies like 23andMe, Circle DNA, uh, Ancestry, where the quality just isn't there to diagnose a patient. So our job in the laboratory when we sequence is trying to find a known mutation that causes a disease where 23andMe and these other Circle basically just kind of sequence your DNA and just kind of find stuff. The quality of sequence also isn't there. Uh, we sort of rank quality of the sequence by sequence depth read. And if you don't have a certain, certain depth read in that sequence, you're not going to be able to find some of these rare variants. And the other thing is that you know, 23andMe uses what we call a SNP array. And SNP array isn't even sequencing. It's sort of a DNA chip that has oligos and, and they sort of... Uh, adhered or bind to it, and then whatever reading you get, you get. So I look at 23andMe as just kind of a commercial thing. It, you know, you get it done because you want to see if you're part Viking or something. Who knows? Or if you have the this is a classic one, the cilantro aversion. You know, so that's that's what I would use 23andMe for. And if you are looking for a true diagnosis or looking to see if you have a predisposition for a disease, then you come to a company like ours or. Or even, I mean, there's tons of clinical grade companies, but um, usually also clinical grade testing is ordered through a physician. So if you're ordering it yourself, probably not clinical grade. So if we were curious about our certain genetic predisposition, we would not be ordering a test from you? More than likely, no. <laughs> uh, it, you know, the way we operate is that if you are suspected of a disease, you would probably go see your physician. And then based on your diagnosis or your suspicion of a disease, you would then pick a panel or genetic panel that would fit that. Um, so you would not be diagnosing yourself more than likely. Um, there are some that do. That's a different channel. But um, I would say that if you want something more clinical, you would go to your physician first. Okay, thank you. So um, Chris, I'd like to ask you, uh, in your many years of biotech investing, what's your, what's your view on this space? How do you see this space evolving and how do you make investments? So for longevity, right? Yeah. Um, so I think obviously there's a lot of hype in longevity um, in general. And uh, I think it's been talked about since like 20, 30 years ago. Um, I think recently 
there's a lot more focus because of a lot of new tools that's available, right? I think in general, from a, I mean, we're investors, so we look at things from an investor standpoint. I think there's a lot of stuff like supplements that are not clinical grade, that you don't need FDA approval, that there's probably not a lot of clinical evidence, but some of them are backed by even Harvard professors. Um, so there's a lot of hype, but that's, those are not the type of technologies that we would invest in. So for us, we're pretty uh, data-driven, so we look at uh, clinical trials uh, data, uh, but the issue with longevity is that it's fundamentally it's hard to do clinical trials on longevity, right? Because one is the time series is very long, and two, there's some ethical issues. So um, when we think about longevity, we we actually look at it from a disease. Sometimes look at it from a disease perspective. And um, so I'll give you an example. Like we invested in a company called Dorian Therapeutics from Stanford. So right now there's a lot of uh, a revolution in cancer therapy. It's called immune oncology, using your own T cells, reprogram it, and then go and kill your the, the cancer. Right. So there's already really interesting innovations in that space. But one of the issues is when you do CAR T, it's ex vivo. So you extract the T cells outside of the human body and you basically reprogram it ex vivo, it means outside of your body. But because the T cells are outside of your body, they go through something called senescence. So they age very quickly. So that when you put it back into your body, what happens is it's aged already. So they're loose functionality. They're not as strong in terms of attacking the tumors that you want. So here, that's a problem, right? That's an aging problem, very specifically for a specific therapeutic. So what we do, what Dorian does is they have a special technology, basically focused on a specific target of the T cell to, re, to basically reduce that aging, ideally prevent that aging so of, of those T cells when it's outside your body so that when they reprogram it, it's still, still very vibrant, very, very strong, so that when we inject it into, back into the body, it's then very strong in terms of killing the, the, the tumor cells. So do you, get, do you get my sense? Like, you can't invest in longevity on a broad uh, perspective, especially if you want to get FDA approval, because um, you need to go through clinical trials. But if you pick specific areas, the, the example I just told you, and you could show that this can reduce you know, aging of that specific cell type, and you show therapeutic response, there's a lot of potential there, right? And obviously, this is immune oncology, cancer-related, so it's a pretty big, pretty big market. So those are the, that, that's kind of our angle in terms of attacking or investing in the space. Could you say that potentially if you could delay aging in a T cell, that you could delay aging in a, you know, your bodily cells? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's, there's already, if you look at the literature, there's like 75 different approaches that have shown by data reduce aging in mice. There's like 75 different approaches. And already there's like 60 to 65 clinical trials uh, done on humans right now that are related to certain cell types. Mm -hmm. So it's already being done. That's why the field is, is very, very interesting. But I think it's all I'm saying is from an investor perspective is, is kind of important to kind of see beyond the hype and then go deep down into what exactly the, the problem that they're solving. All right, Dr. Fu, I'd like to understand the clinical, uh, clinical side of things. Um, if we're talking about aging as a doctor versus a venture capitalist as you are now, what, what would be the difference in viewpoints and opinions you would have towards this topic? So, because my background is in clinical neurology, I see a lot of patients, and especially in neurology, it's mostly aging patients. So, people call it a kind of old people uh, department because we see a lot of aged patients. Um, so, I'm very close to the fact that, so I have a great understanding of that a lot of diseases, age itself is one of the largest risk factors. And that, so when it comes to longevity or thinking about investing in longevity, at the end of the day, our investments are trying to propel the next technologies that would really change medicine or change healthcare. And so that, that's something that's, that really excites me. And that's which is one of the reasons why I made that transition from my clinical background to, to a VC is to really find these technologies that could benefit, benefit human in general. So and I think longevity, as Chris mentioned, is it's a field of growing science, growing evidence. There's, there's more and more understanding of the pathways that, that's behind everything. And so potentially, if we can take aging out of the equation, a lot of diseases are easily, well, not easily, but would potentially be lowered in severity, if not cured. So for example, like Alzheimer's is, is something that we care about a lot, um, or, 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 base, or even more common things such as cardiovascular 
diseases or stroke, which are all related to aging. So, so that that's really uh, my excitement and my why longevity really uh, really resonates with my background. And uh, lastly, Richard. Uh, you're a computational biologist, so can you tell us what you're excited about in machine learning and biology at the intersection of these two topics, and how do you foresee this um, developing in the future? Yeah, so uh, I'm primarily interested in, so my background is in machine learning, and I think uh, everyone's heard the adage, uh, if you have garbage in, garbage out. And so the thing that I focus on first is thinking about the data that you collect, and so thinking first about the sort of tools that get built, the platforms that allow you to collect better data, and looking at that first, and then thinking about how you can build machine learning models on top to, to help you do better. Uh, so some things that are exciting are uh, lowering DNA sequencing costs, both the short read sequencing that you can get from uh, companies like Illumina and Beijing, and then also the sort of long read sequencing that is competing with them, uh, PacBio. Um, and so with those two, uh, basically, modalities coming online and becoming cheaper and cheaper, scientists can basically do better studies uh, at cheaper and, and find actually new ways of even reapplying these. Um, so, for example, a company that uh, built on top of that, 10X Genomics, which I'm also super excited about, uh, does that essentially built on top of those uh, short read sequencing modalities. Um, so, so, yeah, I think about data first, at least for me, um, <clears throat> so uh, that's that's at least the data question. And then the second thing is, I think f when people think about AI for aging, they always think about uh, AI for drug discovery. Um, and there are like hundreds of AI for drug discovery startups. Um, one of the ones that I think exemplifies how I think about you know how it actually is going to impact the future is one called Recursion Pharmaceuticals. Basically, the, a lot of it is hidden um, behind you know sort of like a veil of hype. Uh, but fundamentally what they do is they combine these sort of automation and robotics platforms that you can do now with uh, really fast data collection. And then you can train ML models to, be, to essentially see through the swath of data that you collect and figure out um, correlations that humans and scientists can't uh, find uh, by themselves. And so, so that really, I think, points to the crux of where I think ML can be useful is to find these patterns um, and help us discover like even the smallest things that... Uh, uh, we would not otherwise be able to see. So let's start with with a really hard question for you then. Um, can machine learning help us live longer? And how would you do that? Yes, but I don't want to say that it's so easy. I think there's a lot of things at play here. Probably like sleep, exercise, diet come first. But I think actually one thing I want to mention is there, back in the 1800s, a statistician named uh, Gompertz discovered that there's this law that uh, you're basically your mortality rate grows essentially exponentially uh, as you age, and so it's interesting because like there are no humans that live to like 110. If you see someone at 120, that they're, they're probably lying. Um, and so, and actually, some physicists have come up with basically models for what might actually be going on. And if you look at it, it says, well, there's not one single thing that you can fix and then it'll un unlock the the path to like living to 300. In fact, it's like a, like a number of things that you all have to solve all at the same time. So uh, cancer is one of them, like uh, free radicals is one of them, and like, like telomeres might be one of them. And so we, we have people working on all of them. Uh, even if one of them succeeds, it's not going to dramatically change the thing. And so I think machine learning is, is, is not one of those two. Maybe I could also help out Richard as well. I think, uh, so there's actually a company doing exactly that. Um, um, it's called Spring Discovery, um, using basically machine learning for longevity is based in, in Palo Alto. So what their thesis is this, like, because there's different methodologies um, that are shown to be successful in, in animals to actually reverse aging. So there's one, it's literally, it's literally called parabiosis, which is basically there's a old mouse and then a, a young mouse, and then they do some sort of surgery where they connect the blood vessels, so they, the old mice, so they share each other's blood. And what they, they don't know why, but what they saw was that the older mouse actually start to get younger. And obviously the, the younger mouse starts to age faster, right? So it's kind of sick, but, so, but, but this actual experiment was done, right? And this is a famous professor called uh, Thomas Rando did this at Stanford. And, but they don't know the reason. They think there's something in the blood. There's a lot of hypotheses. And I think part of the reason why they don't know the reason is 
there's a, there's a lot of other things in the blood that we don't know about. So this is, this, and I think that's where there's so many variables that that's where uh, this company, Spring Discovery, is trying to employ machine learning to try to figure out what elements in the blood that we haven't, we don't know about for sure that's really inducing this sort of anti-aging effect, right? Um, so I think if it's going to be successful or not, I think the verdict is still out. I mean, they raised a lot of capital, a lot of famous VCs backed it. The founder was, uh, was a very famous guy from um, a Khan Academy, actually. Um, he was one of the, the first employees of Khan Academy. Great guy, great, great company. I hope they're successful. But I think um, that's, that's an area they, they want to focus on. And I think to the point, I think the other thing interesting about this space is that I think um, there's different ways of looking at this problem, right? I think... Angie was talking about, I'm sorry, Richard was talking about um, the, from a physics perspective. But I think nice about this topic is that there's still a lot of unknowns and there's a thought, still a lot of areas that we don't even know what to ask the right questions on. So I'll give you an example. Like, you know, in the, in, hum, in, the, in, in the biological world, there's actually animals that are actually living forever. So there's a, there's a species of, of jellyfish that when they undergo stress, the old jellyfish actually reverts back into a gamete type state, which is basically like a infant state. And then they get old again and then they could revert back. So they, they basically somehow don't age. Yeah. I mean, they're not immortal. They can still be eaten by predators and so on, but, <laughs> but, they, but they, they can then somehow regenerate. regenerate, which is obviously is a very simple organism. But um, the question is like, how can we? What can we learn from that, right? Because a lot of our medicine is actually learned from, you know, plants and animals. So I think there's a lot of a lot of interesting things to to look into. So considering all these things that might be discovered or could be developed, how long do you think uh, humans will live in 30 years? For example, like what will be our uh, life expectancy? Well, I think if you even look at, this is not even a biological question. If you look at the life insurance industry, they have whole actuaries building tables about human uh, lifespan because that's core to the business, right? I mean, the, long, you know, the lifespan of the people it relates to the, the health insurance product. But I think some of the f folks in the life insurance industry, what they're telling me is that the kids born today, they're expecting them to live not 70 or 80, but like 100, 110, 120 because they're accounting for increases in except for the U.S. this past year, because actually life expectancy went down. But in general, life expectancy has gone up, and then they're, they're counting for advances in medical medicine. So if you look at the actuarial tables, the kids born now actually have a very high life expectancy, like 100, which is like pretty amazing. But that's like a sort of like an extrapolation of previous trends, right? Like the actual drivers of that would you say are unknown or what do you think would be the drivers of that life extension? Well, like I said, for, for mice, I mean, they already show a bunch, six, there's like the literature shows there's all different approaches, but they were able to like double uh, a mouse's lifespan, mm -hmm. right? And certain genetic mutations allow for certain mice to live instead of three years, 20 years. So that's even seven X, six X. Now, obviously more simple organisms. The issue is where the direct extrapolation is we, in our industry, we see that a lot of things work on mice, but then it don't work on humans because it just doesn't, right? Even though our DNA is a lot, a lot similar, but there's still enough differences. So I think, I think it's hopeful that there's potentially a way to, to significantly in, increase that. But then there's a lot of potentially ethical issues, right? Like, how do you deal with social security? How do you deal with, you know, that there's a lot of other issues uh, besides science. Um, I think what we've done, like tech, human technology and human discovery has gone so far. Um, and, you know, just thinking about how we kind of breakthroughs in terms of infectious disease, obviously COVID, uh, the breakthrough in the vaccine is, is a huge leap for human um, science. Um, in medicine, and um, and then and then with the chronic diseases, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, how we're being we're starting to to know how to control everything and um, to fix fix these problems in in real human beings, and as well as the uh, development in cancer, like the um, the life expectancy of a cancer patient has dramatically increased in the past years, and so uh, from a medical perspective, it's we're really hopeful to see that kind of progression in terms of being able to, to uh, avoid certain diseases killing us. Um, but I think uh, one of the huge challenges that we're going to start facing is, yes, we might be able to live to 120, but I, I mean, there's, along with the longevity question is, is lifespan versus health span. 
So of the 120 years, how many years are we cognitively active and we're actually functional, right? And I think that's, that's going to be one heck of a challenge as well is um, we're seeing the rise of Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and then it's, it's creating like a, a huge toll on society. So how are we going to tackle with that problem? And um, are we able to, to get to 130 or 150, but being in an active state and functional state and not burden um, the entire society with certain diseases? So, um, which is a very, um, uh, it's a very challenging thing to go after, but um, it'll be very important for us. So can you follow up a little bit about disease versus aging? Um, some people say that we die of disease, not aging, right? But then certain diseases are caused by aging. So what should the focus be if we want to extend our lifespans? So the way I kind of see it is, if we look at it from a medical point of view, aging is a risk factor. It's a, it's a risk factor for certain diseases. So as you age, you have a higher chance um, as Richard kind of mentioned, your higher chance of getting certain diseases and, and at the, uh, of course, dying of these diseases. So I think once we take aging out of the equation, it doesn't mean that we can live forever. It just means we have a higher chance of surviving from these diseases uh, in a better, better fashion or, or getting these diseases maybe later, later on in, in our life. So I don't think it's going to be, let's take out aging and then every, like, all the problems are going to be solved. Um, obviously, we still have infectious diseases that, that could strike us again, but aging is a, a, one of the key factors. And so um, I think the breakthrough will be, it's not going to be like a magical pill. Um, so people are working on metformin, on, on other drugs. It's not going to be a magical pill where we take it every day and then we're going to be disease-free. Um, it's going to be, okay, if you do this, if you do certain things, and you age slower, then diseases, the, the risk of you having these diseases will gradually decrease. The risk of getting disease or the risk of dying from the disease? Yeah, because a lot of these, a lot of diseases, for um, let's say like dementia, let's say like cancer, there's these theories about how these, these, these diseases come about because of wear and tear. So because of the, the damage that we constant, our body is constantly facing from oxidants, from everything else. And then versus our, our ability to repair these things, so these damages. So as, as our repair mechanisms gradually fail, we, we end up getting the disease because we're not able to repair it. So uh, part of the age longevity study is, are we able to leverage, for example, like the, this, the, uh, the findings in animals, the gene expressions in animals, um, or other drugs to enhance repair, enhance DNA repair, so that yes, our body is continue, still gets damaged and the wear and tear still comes about, but we can fix it. And, and because we can naturally fix it, for example, the immuno-oncology space, which is working on enhancing it, our immune system so that we're, it's not that we're not getting cancer, it's we get cancer, but the immune system takes it out. And so, so we can continue to live a disease-free life. So I, that's kind of the way I see it. So, uh, Sam, can you build on that a little bit? And can you tell us a bit of what you think of why humans don't live as long as we could? Or is there more potential for us to live longer? And what's keeping us from that? Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's kind of obvious. I think a lot of it has to do with lifestyle, which is obviously not genetic. You know, there's a lot of, like Chris was saying, there's been lots of studies about longevity and who lives longer. And most of it has to do with your lifestyle, you know, smoking, drinking, what you eat, things like that. Pretty simple things that if you change, you obviously live longer. But then there's some clear genetic components there that if you have certain variants or certain, I guess, I wouldn't call them mutations, I guess, but certain variants will predispose you to, you know, a longer life. So the one example I'll give is that there's lots of studies on centenarians, people that live to about 100. When they pool those people together, they show that they have a common allele that's that all of them have. And one is having high HDLs. So does anyone know their HDLs in here? Do you know? Do you know yours? Yeah, anyone know what HDLs are? <laughs> high density. Right, exactly. So every, all the centenarians had really, really high levels of this, what they consider good cholesterol. So that good cholesterol actually kind of filters out some of the bad cholesterol and those, pa those patients, those people all lived much longer and actually looked younger. So there are components like that in genetics that can really sort of predispose you to a longer life. But if you don't have the other stuff, 
it's not going to really make a big difference. So the, the other thing about some of these studies is that when they did look at these people, they showed that the most common thing is that they actually did have really good um, diets. None of them smoked. And they also all exercise or had low or they weren't obese. So those are the commonality traits with people that live longer, plus obviously having a good predisposition. But yes, we could all live longer by just changing certain things. So uh, lifespan is a very complex thing that includes genetic predisposition as well as lifestyle. How much would you say is genetic predisposition? And how much do you think is lifestyle? <laughs> That's a really hard question, but I think some of the studies that have come out say about 25% are probably genetic. What that 25% is, it's hard to determine because, you know, there, like I just mentioned one, there are maybe a whole bunch that we just haven't discovered. You know, there's these, like, the mouse studies are fascinating when they talk about genetics, but we don't always know what's going We know there's a genetic component there, but we just can't always pinpoint what that component actually is. How about the worm studies? Like, there is a lot of aging-related studies on worms, the C. right? C. elegans? Yeah. That I don't actually know about. It's been many years since I've worked with C. elegans, but it's the same sort of thing with, I mean, I, I was familiar with my studies and the longevity there, but with, uh, yeah, I, I have no idea, actually. But there, there's some genetic component there, obviously. But to answer your question about like lifestyle versus genetics, I think you've seen this. Um, obviously, we we can't do clinical trials on humans, obviously for for ethical reasons. But there's right now there's a big fad toward um, you know IF right intermittent fasting. Um, there's a big trend toward uh, ketogenesis, right, which is lower carbs and so forth. But you can't do clinical trials. But you did if you look at history, like during I think it was the Great Depression in the U.S., a lot of people didn't have enough to eat. So there was actually studies that look into poor families and, and, and try to figure out, oh, because their hypothesis was that, oh, they didn't have, eat too much, so did they develop a lot of health problems? But the funny thing is they found out that they ended up living much longer than the normal population. And this is actually backed up by mouse studies. So simple things like if you reduce your caloric intake by 20, 30%, you can live 20, 20%, 30% longer for mice, right? Mm -hmm. So that's lifestyle. But I, I, for me personally, I think the lifestyle thing you can do, but it, you're not going to have like double, like you can't go from 70 to 140. Maybe you can go 70 to 85, like the 20%. I think what's exciting is, and that, that kind of stuff everybody can do. You don't need to take a drug, right? But what's exciting for us is also maybe certain pathways, certain novel mechanism action, we can figure out a certain therapeutic where you can unlock additional upside because um, uh, there's still a lot we don't know, even in, uh, regarding our DNA and RNA. Like, there's still a lot we don't know. Dr. Fu, you also mentioned metformin yeah. as a possible thing besides like caloric restriction. Can yep, you elaborate yep. on that? So I think these, these studies are, are just fascinating because, uh, for example, the, cal cal uh, the study around caloric restriction was really based on the theory that if you restricted calories, you would have problems, it would cause problems for the person. Turns out it was a great, like it was a great way of extending your life, and, and that's these are things that I call are are just fascinating discoveries because we're really discovering how the human body works, and so caloric similar with caloric restriction um, studies around metformin has shown. So this is a diabetic drug, and first of all, I'm not promoting everybody to just go out and buy the drug because it does have its problem, uh, its potential side effects and all that. But the drug so. There was a study, um, it was a retrospective study, so going into the database, looking at patients who had diabetes but were taking metformin regularly to control th their blood sugar versus uh, control, pa control people who had no diabetes, were not taking metformin. Turns out the diabetics on metformin actually live longer than the controls. And that just kind of blew people's minds because a a, naturally a doctor would or any, almost anybody would think that a diabetic patient would not outlive a normal person. And so with these studies, and, and of course a lot more studies to back this up, metformin has shown that it's, it has certain properties that are important to cells maintaining a healthy state. So anti-inflammatory, um, antioxidants, it has potentials of activating certain pathways, um, the mTOR pathway that, that is related to longevity. And, but we're still kind of figuring out. We're still figuring out, is it, is it that simple? It, does it translate to humans on a prospective study? And so that's what's going on right now. Um, there's a study that's starting to recruit people to just take metformin prospectively 
and follow them for six years, 3,000 patients, and see would it actually be helpful to decrease um, certain diseases and potentially decrease mortality. So I think we're just uncovering, we're just starting to uncover a lot of these things. And some of these pathways are, are being um, unraveled and we're starting to understand some of this. Obviously, there are some failed clinical trials that, are, that, that we've done already that hasn't shown like inhibiting a certain, certain target. Does that work to, to treat a disease? Um, it's not that simple. And so there's obviously failed trials, but um, I'm hopeful that, that as we continue to gather more and more data, obviously is most important, we will be able to shed more light on what's, what are the key components to, to longevity, to, to living longer. Uh, yeah, going off of that, I think uh, the, the way I think about it is that there's broadly three categories uh, we're thinking about. One is metabolism, which is associated with metformin, rapamycin, like the, the, this mTOR pathway that everyone loves to talk about. And the second two are uh, immunology, and the third one is fertility, because these sort of... And the last two categories are really interesting because it actually turns out that at birth, you're basically born with some finite number of uh, immune cells and some finite number of uh, essentially egg cells. And then uh, it just goes into steady decline from there. And so if you can figure out ways of replenishing stocks of both, then you can imagine a world in which uh, you take, you know, like skin cells, you reprogram them into stem cells and then re-implement them. And basically you, you can, that's one way of rejuvenating yourself. But we haven't gotten there yet. And so stem cell research is another thing to keep, keep an eye on. Since you're, we're on your topic, what, what do you think about assessing how much someone has aged? Like, so what is their current biological age? Like, how would you go about figuring that out? Uh, so the first study that comes to mind is um, this, the Horvath like biomarker, biomarker clock, uh, which is based off of um, if you go to the doctor and have a certain blood panel done, like a metabolic blood panel, and then you take those numbers and you plug them in some like linear formula that spits out an age. Um, and so that was computed from just know, knowing the actual uh, ages of a bunch of people and then just doing blood tests on them. And so that's one way to get your like how you compare it to like a cohort of people that are kind of like you. Um, but there's a lot of noise involved. Um, you can actually do this yourself. Uh, like the blood test is maybe a hundred dollars and then... Um, so you can track that as you as you get older, um, and so because these things are directional, like there's positive and negative signs on them, you can see, oh, maybe I want to keep my creatinine low, um, and so tracking those numbers is is one way. Uh, I think some of the more in interesting ones uh, involve, I think, like a single cell RNA sequencing, um, which is very very expensive, um, and until you lower the cost of that, you won't be able to to use that as a as a diagnostic. Do you see any progress being made in this biomarker space for aging? Uh, I don't really keep up to date, but I am confident that I think as you lower these costs, people are going to find new uses for, for these sort of uh, tools, reagents, um, and then hopefully you'll be able to go into the clinic and then keep track of, you know, maybe I did a intermittent fasting for three months. Does it actually change something? Genomic data be part of that, building a model of, you know, how, how much a person has aged so far. So knowing your DNA uh, tells you, like, what maybe your maximum, like, lifespan is. Um, but in order to actually keep track of how you're doing, like, to reaching that point, you should uh, look at other means because that only tells you, like, a very limited set of information. Yeah, and, and kind of chime in on the uh, biomarker uh, studies. Um, I, I think that's one of, the, prob uh, one of the first challenges to tackle when it comes to understanding longevity is what biomarker do we actually use to, to monitor whether or not we're, um, the, the treatments that we're using actually work. So retrospective studies compared to prospective studies, there are certain biases and problems to it. So it's all about can we perform a prospective study and then from that prospective study, we can analyze the biomarkers and then from, from machine learning AI derive what are the important biomarker markers, and I use S because they're, they're most likely more than one, that we can, we can tell whether or not a person has aged or not. And I think that's, that's, it's extremely challenging for this field because we know of friends that are our same age, but they are obviously much younger than we are. But we also know friends that are either stressed out or for some type are of lifestyle. <laughs> um, or some type. I guess he's pointing at me. Yeah. Pointing at I am older than him, though. No. <laughs> um, but that are obviously uh, that that 
are obviously older. And so, and so that, that, but how do you, how do you judge that? How do you, and no one will know until, until the final day, right? So, so it's, it's extremely challenging. And we've seen technologies where um, scientists are using AI to, to image cells and see if they can tell if it's like how, how old is the cell. And I think that's, that's a very interesting application and that might become a pretty interesting biomarker for us to understand whether or not our treatments are working. And so, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's quite interesting in itself just to think about which biomarkers to go after. So I've seen some companies provide a telomere test as a test of your aging. Do you yes. have any opinion so, on that? So telomeres are, are quite fascinating. For, for some time, people thought we could use telomeres to, to exactly pinpoint, like how, long do you, how, long le- how many years left do you have? Um, so for, the, for people who are not familiar with telomeres, basically these are protective caps at the end of our chromosomes. And if they get too short, they end up, uh, the cell ends up dying. So the obvious thinking is, logic is, okay, so as long as we figure out how long a person's telomere is, then we know how long the cells are able to survive, hence the person, how long they are able to survive. But then as science uncovers itself, we find out that there are actually uh, telomerases, there are enzymes that add on to the telomeres if you're actually doing the right things. So these telomeres are actually flexible in, in their length. And uh, Elizabeth Blackburn, who, who um, the, the scientist that um, received the Nobel Prize for this research, she also has research around how there are certain things that we can do to, in, to increase the length of our telomeres and um, exercise, re-eating the right things. And one of, interesting enough, one of the things is, is networking is having a strong network of friends and family that supports you and, and a community that, that, that's around you. And that turns out to be a pretty, in, pretty uh, important part of increasing the length of your telomere. So, um, so yeah, so, which gives us a lot of hope that, that there are certain things that we can do at this point of time, no matter what our age uh, is, to increase our potential longevity. Yeah, I was gonna say, there are a few companies that do that, and that would, I would put those in the category of 23andMe. So don't, <laughs> you could do it, but don't expect a whole lot of info that's going to help you. Yeah, I mean, in general, we, we see a lot of um, this sort of biomarker discovery companies, but ultimately, like, let's say for the consumer or for you, like, you find out how old you are, but, like, so if you can't do anything about it, that, you know, so for us, we actually look... From an investment standpoint, you focus on like the therapy, the therapeutics. Um, the the reporting is interesting, but I, maybe only as a mechanism to track if the therapeutic is working. Uh, because telling you how like your <laughs> how how old your you know how much senescence you have, and just, I mean that's interesting, but like what can you do about it, right? Yeah. So um, let's talk about what you can do about it. I mean, there's a lot of technologies in development right now, including gene therapy, regenerative therapy, organ replacement, tissue engineering, all sorts of things. What do you see as, you know, close to nearing possible commercialization or what do you see as being most optimistic for actually making a difference? I mean, maybe Dr. Fu can comment on this as well, but just from, at the end of the day, I mean, there's, we only look at, we, we try to look at more data-driven, um, like backed by science approaches. So we look at what's happening in terms of clinical trials, like what's in phase one versus phase two versus phase three, what's closer to be on the market, right? So we do see a lot of companies doing uh, clinical trials ne- dealing with uh, like regener- neo-regenerative uh, medicine. So like related to your, your nerves, so your you know, your brain, certain brain disorders. Also on the eyes. Um, there's even a company that focuses on hearing. Like hearing, like as you get older, you because of damage or whatever, loud music or whatever, you, you lose hearing, right? So there's companies focused on regenerating hearing abilities. So, you know, certain, we definitely see, I mean, again, this is just based on, the, the, some of these companies are public, actually. Uh, so public company data, uh, clinical research data, I think these are some some things that are coming in in, in the pipeline. Um, we even saw a company that was uh, dealing with uh, stem cells, reprogramming stem cells, so you can basically extra- extract your fat cells and you can reprogram into stem cells and you can grow hepatocytes, which is for your liver. You can also grow um, for your hair. So 
but still, that's a bit far away. But what we're seeing are some of the things I mentioned earlier. That, that seems a little bit closer in terms of fruition and coming on the market. So these are very sort of like targeted related therapies, yeah, there's right? no Because again, like you, you can't be general lifespan. How do you do, how do, you do a clinical trial on that? How, could, how do you gather data on, oh, you're getting younger, but what are, you, what are you looking at? You know, you need to look at specific things at this point in time. I think um, to add on to that, um, I think as we continue to study longevity science and why cells, why, what, what, what are the certain things that make cells or people live longer, we start to unravel new pathways. And with each pathway, there's a potential that that pathway is a huge, has a huge impact on a specific disease. And so as Chris mentioned, we're, it's not really about, are we using gene therapy to go after it? Are we using small molecules? Or how are we going to tackle it? It's about having that first scientific discovery and then figuring out, okay, now we have this super breakthrough technology or, or discovery. What can we apply, apply it to, to really benefit humankind um, in terms of treating diseases, or improving health span or so, or so forth. So I think that's, that's what gets us excited is, is about um, new scientific dis- discoveries that are so powerful and impactful that they can potentially treat many diseases that are related to aging. So yeah, so, that, so that's kind of how, how I see it. So would you say uh, that discovering new pathways related to aging is more difficult than developing the therapeutics? Um, I think the toughest part is proving it out. <laughs> um, I think, um, and that's why there's all these, uh, the, uh, the C. elegans models, the mouse models on aging. It's because it's, it's easier to analyze an organism with a lifespan that's shorter than humans, right? And so we can quickly prove out a target that has potential. But the, the target has potential in that organism. Now we need to do certain things to translate into humans and to benefit humans. And, and that's the toughest part is, to, is proving it out. And sometimes figuring out the strategy of proving it out is also very difficult. So a lot of people are just are going after like osteoarthritis, which is a pretty easy, accessible kind of place to inject certain drugs. That's it's the proving out that's going to be the toughest. And, um, and that which is why uh, Chris mentioned Dorian Therapeutics. We, we like their approach because as cell therapy, cells outside of the body age super fast, potentially a drug that can work on these cells um, could quickly be proven out to be beneficial to human cells. And so that's an approach that, that we think was pretty interesting. So as a topic within therapeutics, I think CRISPR is a very um, popular buzzword these days. Do you see this as an important tool in solving what would be genetic or uh, aging issues? Um, I think the power of CRISPR is that it is a, it's because of the science of genetics and the understanding of genetics that we have, we can directly go after the specific gene that we suspect is the culprit. And that makes it a very powerful tool because we don't need to think about, okay, so how are we going to design this drug? How is it just chemically active? Does it like what's what's going to be the bio distribution in the body if we have the right delivery tool which is which is the challenge with crispr or gene therapy technologies right now is how do we deliver it to the right cells but once we get once we go through that bottleneck get through that bottleneck we get into the cell we can immediately go after the the targeted gene that we want to go after and so it becomes a it's first of all it's a super powerful research tool because we can immediately analyze whether or not the gene is the culprit um, by, by just CRISPRing out the gene. Um, and then as we cont- continue to translate it into potential therapeutics, uh, which we are actually seeing like great, um, great advances in, in gene therapy, um, potentially CRISPR becomes the tool that once we find a cer- certain gene, we can immediately reprogram the CRISPR to go after it. And, and so that's the power of it. It's, it's become so modular and it's like program, it's like writing a new program. So, um, so that's going to be the benefit of having the CRISPR tool. I was just going to say that the other benefit is that it just speeds up research so much. Um, I think most, a lot of us have done research in the laboratory and some of us have knocked genes out, but when I did it, it took months to knock out one gene. We're here, you could do it you know, tomorrow and then have uh, results, you know, in weeks and things like that. So it really just speeds up the process. And like you were saying, it can, you know, once you knock out one gene, you can really figure out a pathway. And that's what you're trying to discover, pathways. It's just so much easier than it used to be. So as a 
as a genetic test provider, do you foresee genetic testing and genetic editing becoming sort of like an ecosystem <laughs> or something that would go hand in hand? Yeah, you know, this idea of gene editing, I think is still a little bit, I mean, it exists and there have been some diseases that have benefited from it, but as a kind of a therapeutic for general humans, I don't, I don't know if it'll ever be applied. Um, it like, it's really complicated to target cells and things like that to, you know, edit your gene. Uh, I, I, if a company ever got into that, I'd be very worried <laughs> about gene editing. So I think from a genetic, from a company standpoint or from, from like a broad genetic standpoint, you know, our job with, with longevity or whatever is trying to discover these diseases before it makes an impact, before it shortens your lifespan. So for example, for cancer, you know, if we test, like there's tons, everyone in here is pretty healthy, but do, does everyone know their genetic predisposition? And that's where sort of the genetic testing can be powerful is that if we discover that you might have a predisposition, then we can potentially catch it earlier and treat it earlier and thus, you know, you live longer. So, uh, Chris, you've invested in CRISPR technologies so far as well. What do you see as the main barriers to making this a commercializable technology? Well, yeah, I mean, we invested in a CRISPR company called Mammoth um, Biosciences. It's actually founded by Professor Doudna, who just won the Nobel Prize for her work in CRISPR like a couple months ago. So, like, the, the issue, I think the issue with CRISPR is it's still relatively new discovery. So there's a couple issues now. Um, right now, a lot of the therapies that shows promise is actually ex vivo. So it's done outside the human body. It's because two issues, when you try to deliver CRISPR into the human body, your immune system, which is an, a beautiful, elegant system, will attack it because it, it recognizes as a antigen or as a, some sort of foreign entity. So it's, so it's hard to have more than one dose. So delivery is an issue. The other thing is um, you're worried about something called off-target, basically because CRISPR is essentially a scissor, genetic scissors. If you inject it into, let's say, an animal or let's say a person, right, you can have some off-target issues, meaning they cut the wrong, you can't predict 100% that will cut that particular gene that you want, right? What if it goes and starts cutting randomly your DNA, then you're, you're basically screwed, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's permanent, right? Yeah. So there's other ways people are now trying to figure out, maybe not cutting the DNA, but focusing on RNA because it's more translational, right? So there's different... But, but that's kind of like some of the core issues. So I think ex vivo, you see a lot of promise, like sickle cell anemia is basically being cured with CRISPR, like ex vivo. So basically doing it outside of your body and then rejecting, injecting it back in. But in vivo, it's because it's, it's still really potentially very dangerous. Um, so it's therapeutic wise, at least in the Western world, um, it'll probably take some time. I mean, we don't know what the Chinese are doing because they already, like two years ago, it's funny, we invited the CEO of Mammoth to Taiwan to give a talk. And that was exactly the same month where that Chinese researcher said that he, apparently he went in using CRISPR and knocked out two of these kids' uh, DNA for good. So apparently that's to help them. Like, for, for essentially kind of, I think the reason was, HIV. yeah, HIV, right? But I, I, I mean, I, let's see. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen, right? So there could be some foreign governments, because CRISPR, is, you can even order it. Like, there could be foreign governments or foreign entities that are doing things that we don't know about. But, I mean, it's shown to be doable in embryonic state, right? Like, you can cut out genes without too much problem in, while the, the person is still an embryo. But once you are a human, mature person, it becomes much harder to do. Yeah, because part of it is your immune system. Your immune system is, is there to protect you. And it, the, fir the first time it might get through, but the second time, your immune system automatically responds and, and basically neutralizes it. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot, of try a lot of delivery technology trying to make it stealth trying to coat it with LMPs, like li liquid nanoparticles, try to coat it with different things so that it can escape the immune system. But that's one big challenge is delivering this into yeah. in vivo, into the cells, and then delivering to the right cell, right? So it's, it's actually, I mean, he's right. I mean, it's going to take probably take some time. But there's so much potential that there's a lot of companies putting a lot of capital behind this, yeah. And as you mentioned, um, yes, the, the technology is there to edit an embryo's 
uh, genes right now. Like we, the, the, uh, the scientists actually did it, were able to do that, but it just opens up a very dangerous uh, field where if we allow just random editing of, of this gene and that gene and certain babies, potentially we might see diseases that we've never seen before. And, and that's, and what's going to happen then. So it's, I think that's, it's going to be very, very far down the line, how we, and then with CRISPR um, controlling this, controlling the safety of it, that's part of a huge issue of this field right now. But potentially if you knew the genetic predisposition of longevity, you could edit an embryo to live longer? Yeah, or, or, or just taking out certain inborn genetic diseases. I think that's more likely because, again, lifespan, it's not one gene. At least we haven't discovered. It's probably multiple. Like most diseases, it's not one genetic defect. It's actually multiple. Yeah, I mean, we can already do that sort of thing right now with pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where if you have, if we know your child or you have a high risk for a disease, they can go in there and select embryos that are quote-unquote disease-free and implant those. So that kind of stuff is more likely than trying to figure out all the rest of it. Like, like you said, it's, it's more targeting the, the diseases that, you know, shorten lifespan than it is really elongating things. Um, going back to CRISPR, there are other genetic techniques that, uh, are, that can target cells that are, that are much safer than doing CRISPR. You know, there's, there are drugs already out there. Not dr- I guess they're drugs. Bio, yeah. Therapies that um, will upregulate gene expression for certain certain disorders. So there are things that, you know, you can do or therapies that exist that target the gene or at the cellular level that are by far safer and have gone through FDA approval, things like that. Okay. So just beyond these sorts of drugs and therapeutics, um, Richard, do you have any other opinions towards aging? For example, there's a lot of talks about simulating the human brain and extracting consciousness and inserting into machines, these sorts of things. Do you think these are going to be feasible? I mean, uh, Elon Musk thinks it is, right? So what's your opinion? Uh, <laughs> I guess my only, I think there's a lot of interesting science fiction that you can imagine. I think, for example, in the 1970s, people were saying, oh, we're going to have flying cars in 30 years. I don't think that the human imagination is, is, uh, is small. And I think that uh, we have the ability to imagine many, you know, pretty fantastical things. And I think just like flying cars are probably not going to be a thing back then. I think similarly, there's there's some things that we probably, for for like better or worse, will not happen. And I think uh, understanding and like downloading the brain into a computer um, is, is one of those because it, it's probably easier for us to basically grow, a, like, like simulate or like uh, evolve a child like brain than it is to like download an adult one, for example. Um, but and it, these are all like speculations, right? Um, so yeah, I don't want to comment further on it. I, so I've heard of an interesting idea where I think this was also a company, but it's kind of outside of our range. So, um, but the company was trying to basically pre-record answers to questions. So basically, um, for a certain certain individual who would like their kind of conscious or wisdom to continue. They can pre-record like hundreds of questions in front of a computer. And then the AI would sort of kind of fit all of that together so that when the individual does pass away, his, his kids, his grandchildren will be able to, to talk to the, the computer, kind of ask the computer certain questions, and he will be able to answer them. So I think that might be, it's feasible with the technology we have already. Um, and then we can let our imagination kind of roam around on how the computer could potentially extrapolate other questions that might not be pre-recorded, but they could, but the computer might be able to kind of say, uh, kind of I expect the person to answer it this way or that. So that might be kind of interesting. Yeah, so simulated consciousness. Okay, so conclude with one question for Dr. Fu. If we all wanted to live longer, <laughs> what would you what would you suggest? Like w- one thing that all of us can do to live longer. I think the uh, there's this very very interesting theory that that I came across when I was researching on longevity, 
And it kind of pieces together a lot of the findings scientifically that we have. So for example, the, the intermittent fasting, the caloric restriction, why does that work? Why do certain things work? And for example, like why, do, why do dementia um, happen with people who have lower educational status, certain things like that? Um, and this theory talks about how um, we have a homeostasis capacity. So if we can imagine ourselves back in our like younger state or teenager state, we can do a lot of things um, that we can recover from it very quickly. So for example, you go on a roller coaster ride, you come down, you're kind of dizzy, but like a minute, two minutes later, you're fine, you're playing, you're, you're again, kind of normal again. But if we all go on the roller coaster now, it's, we're gonna be sick for like half an hour or something like that. So there's this, there, the homeostasis uh, property of the human being is one of the most important things that keep us, keep our body continue, uh, functioning correctly. Um, so we're able to maintain our body temperature, we're able to maintain a certain state of metabolism, all because we're able to kind of return back to the normal state, the balanced state. But as we continue to age, the homeostatus capacity continues to worsen. And so, so another example is if we do an all-nighter when we were young, it's, it's fine. We can operate functionally the next day. But now if, if I do it today, I'm not going to be functional tomorrow. So if we see that as the aging process, then we can look back at the science. And, and it's interesting that we're seeing that if we do certain things to, to challenge our homeostasis uh, capacity, it actually helps us to maintain our health and potentially increase our longevity. So the thesis behind caloric restriction or intermittent fasting is because we're challenging our body to go into that fasting state and then come back to the normal state and then go into the fasting state and then do this on a routine basis where we can expand our capacity of recovery so that we're able to deal with stress, we're able to repair our genes and so forth. So I think that's a very interesting um, way of looking at it. So now we can think about how do we challenge ourselves? And then the, the important part about challenging ourselves is not going to, to the edge. It's not because in the uh, intermittent fasting studies, intermittent fasting works for, it works for certain age groups. It doesn't work for the, for the old and fragile groups. So you, we can see it as if we test ourselves, our homeostasis capacity beyond our limits, that it'll actually cause disease and worsen our body. So with our current status, we can think about, you know, ex exercising is an obvious way of, of, it's not an exciting answer, but <laughs> exercising does in, increase our homeostasis capacity. Controlling our diet also is, is also helpful. Challenging our brain. So for example, with a lot of dementia studies, um, the more we challenge ourselves, the more we, we try new things, we build up our neurological or cognitive capacity so that as we age, we don't get into that dementia state as early. And so we challenge ourselves to, to try new things, to go to new places, to meet new people, interact in new ways and look at new companies, invest in new companies. And potentially that'll, that'll keep us going and not retire so, so soon, right? And um, so keeping that homeostasis, challenging ourselves with the homeostasis capacity, I think that's something that, that I'm definitely going to try myself to, uh, to be able to expand myself in, into... Uh, you know, further ages, yeah. Is that the answer you're looking for? <laughs> well, actually, let me follow up on that question. So Sam was saying that HDL was a differentiating factor for aging and also saw some studies regarding statins that can increase your lifespan. Would you recommend us all to go on statins? Uh, from a clinical physician's point of view, I'm not going to recommend anything that doesn't have is not a, approved through FDA, right? Approved through clinical trials. Um, I think the closest thing is metformin uh, in terms of extending lifespan. Um, that's probably the closest thing, but it's still, it's, the clinical trials are just starting. So we're going to have results in a couple of years. So um, we can, in the meantime, um, I'm, I'm still going to advise for um, exercising, going on a, <laughs> on the right diet. And, you know, so it's, I know it's the boring, it's the boring answer. Like our body is really the accumulation of, of what we do every single day. And so if we want our bodies to be able to, to, to go beyond limits, and, and the fact is, if we're going to live to 150, we're going to be like the top, like 0.1% of the population in the world, right? So if we're not doing anything consciously to build ourselves up to that, that peak, then there's no way we're going to reach it. So it's an everyday task. Um, it's kind of like building a company, 
um, it's, it's the everyday work that you put into it. But so for your parents, is there anything now that you would maybe prevent it? Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a supplement you want them to take, or maybe it's, you know, stem cell. You want them to extract their stem cell and store it for future. I mean, is there are procedures that you would do for your parents right now, because we all want our parents to live longer, right? That you would recommend or you force them or you ask them to do. Maybe not force, but ask them to do. Like, you know, whether it's do, do, the, do the genetic testing, um, you know, get your T-cells extracted, get, take this supplement or something of that. There's, there's a number of things that I've... <laughs> so, so one thing that I... Actually, a couple things. Uh, I told my dad to get his uh, sleep study done, and he discovered he had sleep apnea, got like a, this like CPAP machine, which basically makes him a cyborg, but he feels like several years younger and like, like is now changing jobs. And I think so that there's like a couple substances you can take, exercise, obviously. Um, banking your stem cells is a very speculative procedure because there's no actual application, but you can have that done. We, we've been talking about stem cells for eons. And, you know, I think when I was in high school, I thought, oh my gosh, it's a miracle. It's a miracle drug or whatever you want to call it. it just, and I get that quite, I used to get that question a lot about core blood and things like that with couples about, you know, I'm going to save this and it's going to cure everything. I mean, in theory, it's a great idea in research. It's great, but I, we haven't found a good way to apply it. But yeah, it'd be great to get a stem cell injection into certain areas and then regenerate whatever's died. But find a company that does that and that'd be great. <laughs> um, but for my parents, yeah, I think it's uh, exercise is a big one. My dad doesn't exercise, ex exercise at all. Uh, I would tell them to go get a cardiovascular workup like on a regular basis too. Because, you know, that, that cholesterol builds up somewhere and usually it's in your heart. So those are the things I would probably recommend. Yeah. Just any activity. My, you know, sedentary life and things like that is a high, high risk for a lot of diseases. So just walking <laughs> would be helpful. Um, but metformin too. Yeah, I think both of them are on metformin. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> so, both, so both your parents are taking metformin? Yeah, but... They, but yeah. Is it because they have diabetes? Or yeah. just no, they're it? like border pre-diabetic. Oh, okay. They're not diabetic, but they're kind of pre, and they've been like that for a while, so they've always taken metformin. <clears throat> and weirdly enough, my mom exercises a lot, but my dad doesn't, but he seems to be more healthy. <laughs> so go figure. He might have some interesting predisposition that... Or exercise yeah. is not good for you. Yeah, it's, it, or something. And he, and he drinks a lot. So I was going to say that there, there are studies of alcohol, alcohol. Yeah, increasing HDL levels, of course. <laughs> Probably not as, as much as that. <laughs> I just wanted to say something. I think I want to open up questions to the audience. And I wanted to introduce a few other people who I think would, could add to the question. I think, you know, Adam, who I've just met, who's like working in longevity, and Dr. Lee, yeah. who is with the Research Institute. Maybe you guys can come up and, uh, if you would like, can you, can you go over right there? Now. What is it? <laughs> no, 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 seriously. Like, so so we're, uh, we're, we're Indie Bio. We're the most active investor in biotech in the world. Mm -hmm. you guys know, like, uh, but I am the internet software guy. So they use, sorry, I'm a call right now. But they use me as a, uh, <laughs> they use me as a test subject. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Anyway, um, so I'm not really good at explaining how this works. Uh, so the, basically the three PhDs who are the co-founders of the, the company, five years ago they did a, a, a basically uh, some sort of biological-based age test for skin uh, called molecular clock or mole clock. It's pretty horrible. Yeah, what? Oh, sorry. And... Uh, yeah, I can't get down there. My, I'm too old. Uh, and uh, so, so basically, they started with that, and then they were they wanted to test uh, peptides against uh, what it would do to skin. So they tested a thousand peptides on skin, um, and then they found one that apparently had some sort of effect. And they put it on. And I guess you have when as you get older, you have young skin cells, and you have older skin cells. And what this thing does is it gets rid of the older ones. And so the younger ones keep on regenerating, and you have fewer or older ones. And you can apply this theoretically to any organ, but they started with skin because, I don't know, it's a bigger organ and there's a lot of money in it. 
Uh, so, um, yeah, so it, it, you put it on your face and it basically pops off your, the old skin cells. So it, 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 instead of, I don't know, like uh, gelatin or whatever, what is that thing called? Uh, uh, well, gelatin and then you, yeah. Uh, before you heat it up, collagen. Yeah, uh, instead of collagen, we have another company that does collagen. It's like basically, yeah, gummy bears. Instead of smearing gummy bears on your face, um, this one is actually supposed to uh, uh, attack the root cause of aged, aged, old-looking skin, which is the old skin cells, and, and basically pop them off. I don't know. I've been using it for three months, but I also have a healthy regimen of Cavalat. So uh, we'll see. Maybe they're like uh, balancing each other out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, I, you know, I, I, I had a wrinkle. And I think it's smaller. Oh, uh, uh, it's called a uh, one skin. So check it out. Uh, Peter Diamandis is like shilling it hard. One skin. One skin. One skin. One skin. One skin. Yeah. Uh, I'm Harry Lee uh, from Glimmersnik. I'm um, come with uh, yeah, and um, I'm happy to hear to hear about uh, stories of uh, you guys. And my question here is, if you have a genetic disease, your stem cells should also have the same problems. So can we use CRISPR Cas9 using stem cell for treat uh, special disease functional problems? CRISPR Cas9 通常我們是用在 embryo, but uh, 如果我們用 stem cell to repair our organ or something else, in the genome problem also 會在那個 stem cell. So CRISPR Cas9 是可以用在 stem cell. Um, I've seen applications where I think what the stem cell, what Sam was mentioning, because we've been a lot of comp well, science in general has been has been trying to use stem cells to the benefit of humans. Um, and trying to use stem cells to treat diseases. There's a challenge with stem cells is we don't really know how, if they do what we want them to do. So for example, with stem cells, the idea is if we inject it into a place, it could grow into whatever we're lacking. So for example, if we have a spinal cord injury, we inject stem cells into the spinal cord, it grows into a new spinal cord, and then, and then our arms and feet can continue to move as it used to, right? So, so I think the... And, but along came gene therapy which, which, or CRISPR, which is able to potentially manipulate certain genes. And so we're starting to see technologies where we could rapidly test, like what can we do to the stem cell to have it do what we want or to, to have it mature into the type of cells that we want it to. And so that's, that's, what, that's what we're seeing right now. But of course, it's not to the state where we are able, to, where we already there's no approved drugs that are able to do this, but I think there's obviously a potential, uh, first of all, uh, research-wise, definitely, because through CRISPR, we could rapidly analyze how do we program the stem cell to have it do what we want, to, to have it grow into the cells, cell types that we want it to. Um, and then down the line, potentially, we could use the CRISPR to program the stem cell uh, into a kind of premature state before we inject it into the body, and then we can get to what we want. So... I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I know recently, many people working on CAR NK. Have you compared about that? Which one is better for cell therapy? NK cells. So the immune system, there's actually a great book if you're interested to learn more about the immune system. It's called The Elegant Defense. It's actually written by a Wall Street Journal reporter that's not a scientist, so he was able to write it like in a, in a very easy to understand way. But uh, basically, the immune system... We're also we're still a lot we don't know about it, but basically there's different types of you know immune cells. I mean B cells, T, everybody does T cells, NK cells, natural killing cells. So yeah, I mean there's people working on basically programming the NK cells to kill target uh, cancer, right? Which one works better? I think it depends on the different cancer type. So right now the only cancer uh, immune oncology therapy that's approved by FDA is actually liquid cancers. So like, um, you know, that's leukemia, stuff like in your blood. The solid tumors are really hard because it's, it's wrapped around kind of a force field. That's why they, they created this force, kind of like a, it's called the cancer microenvironment. So really hard to get into. Uh, so they're hoping like different, by reprogramming different types of immune cells, we can go there and try to cure solid tumors. So one approach is NK cells. Other people are working on macrophages. Other people are working on different things. So 
if it works, I don't know. We have to wait uh, for the for the research, for the data, to, for even a comment. I mean, it's not for me to guess, right? For us, we just look at the data. And then to add on, another promise of CAR and K is um, because NK uh, for T cells, T cells are very specific to a person. So if I wanted to do CAR T, I would have to take uh, the patient's blood out, re, uh, reprogram it, and then put it back. And that's a very lengthy process, as well as a very complicated process. Uh, but for NK, potentially, you could ag- inject a CAR NK into anybody, and, and that, it works in every, any, uh, every single person. So, which is called off the shelf and a CAR NK or off the shelf cell therapy, and that would gra- uh, massively decrease the, the cost, cost yeah. of giving out a, a therapy like this. So that's that's one of the the promises of CAR NK. So, hopefully, it works. Um, we're seeing CAR T has. As, as Chris mentioned, with solid tumors, there's a huge bottleneck there that CAR-T has been able to, to go beyond, but hopefully car and k will do the magic. Please, Adam, and can you introduce yourself? You were telling me in the elevator you're like working on some longevity thing. Well, I'm, I'm uh, and kind entrepreneur, of- Entrepreneur, serial entrepreneur. Yeah, so I've, I've built a few companies in the consumer internet space, uh, and I've had a long-standing interest in longevity science, and so now I'm getting more deeply into it. And uh, I mean, I've, I've had run a few um, events on Clubhouse and stuff like that, and helping people share information, et cetera. Um, and I want to do a lot more. Sorry? We almost set up a Clubhouse today, but we couldn't figure it out. So oh, please awesome. Come early in yes, time. happily. Yeah, so uh, so my current mission is uh, I want to be some sort of catalyst or instigator for growing the tide of progress in the longevity space. And one of the big questions I ask myself, which I'd love to hear each of your responses to, is what is the leverage point that could create an order of magnitude increase in progress in the space? And so there are level leverage points uh, or bottlenecks like a talent, uh, for example, people who may be able to get a job at Facebook paying half a million dollars a year may not want to join a a bio company because it's going to take seven years, not in transferable skills, all sorts of problems like that. Uh, There might be a problem with just uh, uh, capital allocated to the space. There might be a regulatory hurdle, and maybe we need to find a better regulatory regime or hire lobbyists to uh, impact governments and maybe others. So I'm really curious to hear what each of you thinks is uh, the highest uh, highest, uh, impact leverage point. And I just want to say a quick comment because there was a question, what can each of us do? Uh, right now. And uh, often that comment is interpreted to be, what can we do to live longer or healthier ourselves? And I think the answers to that are uh, unfortunately pretty mundane for now. Um, But I think each of us can vote with their dollars by supporting and investing in companies that are raising money in this space. They can spread the word about things that are happening and they can be impactful as instigators of change in their community, et cetera, to raise the uh, consciousness that this is an important thing that deserves attention and uh, resources. That's all, just wanted to share that note. Thank you. Bottleneck, well, uh, I'll give you an example. So, I mean, there's some regulatory issues, obviously, and research takes time. But, you know, we go, I'll, I'll use the CRISPR example. Uh, there was a embryo that was CRISPRed for cardiomyopathy in China with no regulation. So that stuff just happens. Not that we should em- embrace that stuff because obviously there's tons of problems with that. But if there's some way to speed up the research and speed up some of the discovery, uh, I think we'll get there a lot faster, obviously. Because, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean... I, but it has to be regulated to some degree, you know? I mean, we can't have a free-for-all. I mean, Korea had an issue, too, where the doctors were doing all kinds, or the scientists were doing all kinds of stuff and found out half of it was fake. So uh, there's something there, but again, it, it's just the, the length of research in the U.S. has always taken much, much longer than I feel like some other countries. So I don't have a well-reasoned uh, answer to this, but I think reagent costs and overall the cost of biological experimentation in uh, is is a big bottleneck part, like, and I think that's there's very little way around it because the government essentially subsidizes R and D to the extent where uh, companies that provide uh, like like capex like machines like uh, PCR on the low end and like big scale like uh, like like machines that require outlays of like 50k 100k half half a million uh, like they have no incentive to reduce their costs that way and they have no incentive to reduce like the consumables costs. So if you're talking running like a couple experiments, like your your reagents for um, DNA sequencing, for example, have stayed at the similar cost for for the last ten years. Um, so if 
I think I think that's one big bottleneck. Like if you can drop that by a factor of ten, then then we're talking, right? And there's no real reason why uh, we haven't seen that. I think it's just for lack of competition. Yeah. So for, I was just thinking because you said it was a capital. Was it regulation? Was is it talent? I, I think from capital, I don't think so because there's actually like a bunch of long, especially in the Bay Area, like longevity f focus only funds. Like Laura Deming, everybody knows her. She runs Longevity VC. Like there's also Longevity Vision Fund. There's also, there's a bunch of them. They, all they do is longevity. So I think there's capital. Um, regulatory, I do kind of agree, but, you know, because the FDA, I, I mentioned this earlier, right? It's hard to do clinical trial on longevity because you're, you're literally tracking humans, how long they live. So you, you have to, is there some creative way to do this? I, so I agree with that, but I don't have a solution. I actually think it's one potential bottleneck is actually how kind of building up real kind of folks that are deep. Because right now, the, the, at least what we've seen and are some of our founders that are tackling these issues is a lot of them are very good biologists, but they don't know machine learning. Or they're very good at computer science, but they don't know anything about biology. Or they're very deep in chemistry, uh, like uh, molecular, you know, biology or molecular chemistry, but they're not, you know. So, I feel like the, maybe the way that they're being trained is, is very deep, but very kind of very narrow. And I feel like with the advent of machine learning, different tools, different software applications, different modalities. I think what the, the founders that we're starting to see more success from are actually folks that are able to integrate, that could actually code, but also know biology, that know chemistry, and then they, they can actually bring this all together. Because a lot of these biology experiments, I mean, I'm sure Sam can talk about this, is literally like done by hand. Like it's very slow process. Uh, there's a lot of tools now with computers and machine learning that can really propel the progress much faster. Or you can even run simulations even before you do actual uh, experiments. So I wonder if there's some sort of programs out. And some of these, these people are very rare, right? I mean, if we find them, we usually back them. I mean, they have a good idea. So, and a lot of it is, some of it is learned at, uh, you know, at their schools. Some, of, some schools have interdisciplinary programs. But a lot of it is actually self-taught as well. So finding people that are deep, I think that could be a potential bottleneck. But I don't think capital is, there's so much capital everywhere. Um, I don't think capital is an issue. From a more, from a clinical perspective, a lot of, there's one, one of my main concerns is, is the fact that the things that work, especially with longevity, we take as boring. And that becomes, <laughs> you know, prevention is boring. I often hear this in the investing world, prevention, uh, pre a business based on prevention just doesn't work. And it's one of the main struggles as my transition from a clinician to the VC world is there is great value in prevention and the boring stuff, but we just can't get it through and, and get it through to people. I think that's, I think it's sooner or later, um, people would, would find, would be able to build a system that, that prevention is highly incentivized that we would do it. So um, we're seeing healthcare reforms uh, all over the world, basically, going for this, trying to incentivize uh, preventive healthcare and all that. And I think it's, it's gradually going to catch on. But at this point of time, it's, uh, from, from a medical point of view, that's, that, it's a huge challenge to, to be able to push out and, and make prevention a very exciting and um, happy thing to do every single day. On, on the longevity science front, I think, I think we're waiting for that breakthrough. We're waiting for one company that is longevity focused, been researching longevity science for a long time, and leverage that to really develop a drug to treat a disease. Um, there has to be a win. And then once a company has that win, um, people will follow on and say like, oh, this is, you know, we've got to understand this better. Kind of like the immuno-oncology win with the checkpoint inhibitors. And now there's like tons of science, tons of research. Um, that, that's going on in the immuno-oncology world because companies have, have gotten a win. And I think with that win, it'll drive a lot of the, the talents, the, 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 the capital and, um, and the resources to really generate more and more data, meaningful data that could translate into more therapeutics. So, so that would be kind of my, my response. Um, yeah, I think uh, that would be a huge win for whatever company that's developing the drug and giving it to them. Um, I, I think it'll it'll definitely sell, <laughs> um, but it would have to be a a and like an ethical and and it it would have to be 
something that's acceptable to to the general public. So it can't be like an under the table, like non-ethical stuff like that. It, that that's not that it's going to be considered cheating rather than win. Um, but yeah, if if um, if something like that, that'll be a win as well. So quite a lot, but but I have a question. So you seem like a big proponent of genetic testing, which you know you find out earlier, you can treat earlier. But a lot of times you find out earlier and you can't do anything. There's over diagnosis, over treatment, and over stress. You know when you're gonna die, does that mean your life is better? Like, and on top of that, who protects our data? If you know my genetic profile, you know my sequence, and you're an insurance company, that's a big win. You don't even need to know mine. You can know my brothers, my fathers, and you know me. How do you protect against that? Yeah, so these questions always come up. Um, yeah, I don't think gen- genetics is is that g- is as general as that. You know, you say you're going to figure out when what day you're going to die or things like that or you're stressful. Sure Not necessarily. So there's there's laws in the US and many other countries that will protect you against genetic information being released. Yeah. Uh, well, it's gen- theater, it's Well, then I, you know, then I don't know why the laws exist, but yeah, there's a lo- there's an act in the US called GINA that basically protects your genetic information. So you should be, insurance companies can't um, discriminate against that, but life insurance can, so that's a completely different issue. Well, I mean, this is, uh, this is part of it. I mean, if, if you're going to start advancing in this kind of, I guess, technology, there are some things like this that you're going to have to take a risk on. If you don't believe that the, the safety nets in place are going to help you, then you're going to be paranoid and you're not going to get any of this thing done. So, you know, I've had these conversations with a lot of patients that are worried about this, you know, what am I going to do with this, all this information? And I think when you, when you kind of break it down to them in a little bit simpler manner, they, they understand. But I think when you hear genetics, you hit this broad term and then you think, oh my God, it's everything. But in reality, it's, it's not. So that's why, you know, that's why I hate some of these companies like 23andMe because <laughs> going back on this rant, yeah. An insurance company is going to use some sort of like, you have a predisposition and then charge you more because they make it an, a simple black and white. Yeah, that, but again, they have to get access. So if, unless somebody is breaking some laws to get that access, you know, that shouldn't be happening. So like uh, this is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's one of our companies. And uh, how do you get people to proactively do the right thing? And uh, in Asian culture, you know, I'm half Asian, um, there's this predisposition to nag the living shit out of your relatives, right? It's just, you know, like eat your vegetables, do your homework, you know. So we actually took advantage of that uh, with uh, chronic disease sufferers. Uh, so when you have, you know, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, you know, hypertension, you need to take medicine basically every day. If you don't, it's bad. And in a lot of places, people, they feel better and they stop taking it. Uh, so we've had pretty good luck. Uh, we have 65% of the people who start with the app, continue with the app. And then we're driving like 84% adherence. And the key thing is that we give an app to the relatives of the patient. And they get alerts when the patient is falling off the wagon. And then they just bother the living crap out of the patient to take their drugs and to eat right and to be healthy. Uh, and it's very, very quickly grown into one of the, like basically the leading uh, chronic disease management platform in India. And 40% of the population of India has uh, a lifestyle disease. So this is a big market. But it's also, it's just, you know, it's just reminding people to take their pills in a very uh, culturally acceptable way. No, no, because, because we, we touched on neurology earlier, right? And, I, and I've read that with things like Alzheimer's, there's actually, a, they've tra- traced it to like, certain genes that you have a predisposition to for Alzheimer's. So if let's say you have that, but is there currently any therapy or gene cell therapy that can reverse cells from, no, nothing? Oh, okay. Well, I mean, so here's the argument for that. Wait, wait, Chris. So, you know, 
I, I tell That's people, I, I tell, <laughs> I tell people that you know today you may be tested, but you know down the road there might be something there. So your information today might not, you know, you you might not have the therapies or things that can help you right now, but in ten years, five years, there might be a cure or a treatment. So knowing your genetic information may just, you know, help progress some of that, some of those therapies. Five years ago, our knowledge of science. Life has improved. Yeah. <laughs> but, but life expectancy has actually gone down in what? the last five years. Not, not for, but unfortunately, that's the average, you're correct, but if you look at certain economic populations, it's actually gone up. I mean, overall. Yeah. There's I know, always I, ways you can dig down left, right. No, but you're including, yeah, I know your point, but the, right? the people that, yeah. but the I'll folks that down. have like <laughs> access to quality care, they actually went up a yes, lot. Yes, yes, yes. And actually, that's the unfortunate you thing. You live in a richer neighborhood, you live yeah. longer. Everyone knows that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's, let's try to end on the more positive note again. <laughs> <laughs> this is an easy question, I guess, more generic and anyone, everyone can answer. I'm just curious, you know, there's two VCs here. Like, what is the most promising, you know, research or company that you're excited about, you know, in the next, as a next step? Because we, we did cover a lot of ground, um, but, you know, just really honing in on what is the next step, right? Not, not, not talking about the next five, 10 years, but what is within this five years, what can we gen genuinely expect? to come to market? Are there public companies now that's doing something really cool that you can share with us? Are there, you know, research at Stanford or Harvard or Oxford that's doing incredible work or is everybody just so focused on the vaccine and, and not really looking at longevity, but you know, what's, 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 exci what excites you? What, what, what excites you guys every day? Um, so, so one thing I'm really excited about is, this is, this is kind of related to longevity, but it's the idea of regeneration and repair or regeneration and replace. So the idea of, are we able to regenerate like an aging organ or even replace it? So, um, so yeah, so that's an area that I've been looking into. Can we make an artificial organ? Can we um, extract certain things from the science that we know that would boost the regeneration of a damaged uh, tissue or organ? I think that's the area that I'm, I'm looking into because I think there's going to be huge breakthroughs in the next three to five years. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I, I think I mentioned it. There's, there's, there's a lot of clinical trials happening. So, I mean, it's all very exciting, but is it going to work, right? I mean, a lot, most, as you know, most clinical trials fail. So it's all exciting, but for me, it's what will work, right? So we've seen, I told you the company that's, I mean, he already mentioned metformin. That could, that's very gener generic. Uh, there's a company that isolated certain uh, factors in the blood that, for, that seem to work from parabiosis. Uh, there's the company that's dealing with hearing loss. That's pretty interesting. So those are the companies that we've been looking at. And those are like phase two, phase three. So hopefully there should be some good results. So for us, I mean, you just see what works. Yeah. And on the research side, one area that I'm particularly interested in is uh, how you can basically take DNA sequencing machines. Uh, you run RNA from a bunch of different cells through them you can basically segment like these proteins and these RNAs came from like so-and-so cell. And you can do all sorts of interesting things tr like track uh, how um, like baby embryos basically develop and differentiate. Um, and so you can actually plot these out. You can make these very beautiful plots. And it, it sort of tells you that might be like a map to uh, reprogramming stem cells. Um, so, so like this area is broadly like, sem like single cell RNA sequencing technology. Um, and it's very much research right now. Um, so that's what I'm excited about. Okay, thank you to all of our speakers, and uh, that's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs>